Welcome back. This is a part two interview with Jack Caracas in the studio of The Informer and Nicole Dunn from Empower Aged Care joining us. Uh, Nicole, you've heard uh, Jack's uh, story and uh, the situation that uh, is happening to a great many of the uh, residents, not the patients at St Basil's home at Faulkner. Uh, what have you made of the situation and can you believe what, you, what you've heard? Look, it's absolutely shocking to hear that people in aged care facilities are being treated this way. They certainly deserve the um, health care that you and I enjoy and to not be neglected by the very people that are caring for them. Unfortunately, it's not an isolated report at this point in time and other family members have been voicing similar concerns. Nicole, what would you have imagined should have been the proper protocol to follow? when things started to get unwieldy? Look, I certainly think the healthcare teams that have been brought in probably needed to be brought in earlier and transfers to hospital needed to happen earlier. We know that when these transfers started on uh, Monday, there were 84 cases at the time. Um, St Basil's has 150 residents. So when you have more than 50% of the residents testing positive, and when we know that the mortality rate for people in aged care facilities is 44%, there's certainly a clinical need for these residents to be transferred to a healthcare setting. And that just happened far too late, unfortunately. And there was no handover. How, 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 how much more does that co complicate things? And how much more distress is involved for all the families and, uh, and, and, their, um, and their loved ones? Well, without a handover, it means that basic care needs can't be met. You know, if you don't know whether someone needs a modified diet or what medications on they are on, that has grave consequences when they're needing to be fed and when they're needing to have medications to keep them well. So, you know, we have the complications of COVID, but we also have the complications of people not receiving the care that they need because that clinical handover, you know, isn't there. Uh, there's another element of this story that bothers me greatly, and that has been the fact that uh, we, we saw no handover, but we've also heard about the wanderers that you explained to me last week in the interview, that they, they will not sit down, they, they spend most of their days wandering around the, the facility. Now, if you bring a whole new crew in and they don't know the, 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 uh, the residents, uh, how, how do you just start working out what medicine belongs, what room they, they, they should be in, and, um, and, what, and what protocols to follow from there on. So really in the absence of a clinical handover, the new team coming in is dependent on the written notes that are at the facility to identify residents, to identify their health needs, and what is required according to government protocols from there on. It's dependent on those notes being accurate, detailed and up to date. Now you've so, worked in the sector, you understand okay. how difficult it is. How long would it take you to get on top of uh, the situation if you were brought in and looking at those notes, how long before you could work out who was who? Well, you'd experience significant delays of hours and, and days when you've got 150 residents in a facility and you're part of a team needing to go through and check every resident to ensure that there are not further errors occurring. So it certainly would lead to a delay in appropriate care. And Jack was telling us that uh, what, from his understanding of the situation and what the nurse who was brought in as part of the federal government secondment uh, she directed to, uh, them to the fact that there were real problems, but they also learnt and, and, and understood very well that their mother-in-law, or Jack's mother-in-law and his wife's mother, had not been cleaned or attended to for the better part of five days. That's, now that's appalling. Yeah. It's absolutely appalling and it's not an isolated report from family members and I think it's COVID is really exposing some of the fundamental flaws in the residential aged care system. So at this point in time, there is still a Royal Commission into aged care occurring in this country. Now that started in late 2018, is ongoing and has further been extended to incorporate some of these concerns that have been raised about the handling 
of COVID in the aged care sector. So we've known that there have been issues for some time and COVID has certainly exposed that. Um, some of the issues is that we don't have in this country mandated ratios of nurses um, or carers to patients. Um, that's particularly prevalent in the private sector. We also don't have um, ratios for professional carers or healthcare workers in aged care. So there's too much of a reliance on aged care assistants who have a very important role, but we don't have enough nurses, doctors and health professionals involved. And as Jack mentioned, it was a nurse that was really identifying that there was a major issue and going above and beyond to seek the appropriate care. Now we should explain, there are a great many angels, as Jack put it, who are doing a tremendous lot of work, but it, it becomes uh, very, very difficult when you've got um, uh, some of the uh, staff working at these aged care facilities that aren't uh, uh, earning the money that they should be earning perhaps, and they have to work at not one home, but two or three or four. And this just, especially with COVID-19, this just ex ex accentuates the problem. Um, why didn't state government, why didn't federal government, uh, and why didn't the management teams within these aged care centres say, hang on, we've got a real problem, and reach out to, to federal and state beforehand? I mean, governance seems to be a real problem. Yeah, so we know that really, you know, the provision of quality care and that being set at a government level and then mandated right the way through has just not been a priority to this point in time. And that's really what has been exposed by the Royal Commission thus far, that, you know, we're not having um, carers paid at appropriate rates, that we have not got the skill mix right in aged care, where we have a high proportion of aged care workers and a lower proportion of health professionals. And these are some of the fundamentals that really need to be corrected moving forwards to ensure that um, older people in aged care facilities receive quality care on a day-to-day -day basis, not just when there's a crisis that we're responding to. Um, we, we knew there were problems in aged care before. Uh, the, the thing that fascinates me uh, and makes me angry, it's this uh, catalyst uh, that COVID-19 has, has, has become. Uh, it's showcased the shortcomings of the system. And it seems to me that we have to look at how federal government is involved. They have the uh, overarching responsibility. Uh, in fact, their, their, their um, head office uh, at federal level looks at, uh, at whether each and every aged home in the country uh, can meet the standard. Uh, surely some of those standards um, are not, have not been high enough. Well, we know that St Basil's passed their last accreditation last year. But, but they were warned, they were warned, Nicole, that they had yeah. dropped the ball, okay? We should also add that they were on notice and they had made some changes. So we have to be fair to certain, certain key bodies were doing the right thing, but there are, it seems to me, and Jack, you please come in here yeah. and, and, and add to this. Um, it seems to me that everybody who's had a bit of responsibility at this has, has been bl one blindsided by the enormity of COVID-19, but those little syst systematic problems Absolutely. have just been amplified to, at yeah. a level we've never seen before. Yeah. So the, big, the biggest issue to me has been that just procedurally, things have just broken down. So there hasn't been a, a proper tactical response here. And management have been just overcome. Absolutely, and they've been overwhelmed. Um, and we were getting told by that from the, um, from the PCA. A lot, of them were a lot of them were graduates. They had just come into the system and they were thrown into St Basil's as their first stint, right, in a COVID crisis. Wow. So you can imagine um, how overwhelmed they were in the whole process. Uh, Nicole, you and I discussed last week uh, the, the, the challenges that aged care has and you made a very big pitch to me about in care responsibilities and how much better it could be if we can keep them out of the nursing homes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are situations though that, w that we can't, it, it becomes unmanageable and they have to go to a nursing home. The sector has got problems. 
what more can we do? What is the right, what is the right balance is what I'm trying to, to work out. Uh, in care at home is fantastic, but it's, it's not possible for a great many families. We live, we live very busy lives and, and our society is changing at a million miles an hour. What more can we do to make the aged care question one that we can solve or address better than we're doing at the moment? So a lot of that really comes down to reform, starting at a government level and filtering all the way through to a facility level in terms of mandating staff to resident ratios, improving the skill mix and having more health professionals in aged care facilities and improving that transfer transparency in aged care. So it is clear to see the care that people are being provided with and there is that communication in place to families who are deeply concerned at this time. And a lot of that is stemming from recommendations that have already been made uh, in the interim report that has been released as part of the Royal Commission that continues. Nicole, there's a question I want to throw at both of you. Um, we keep saying there's not enough money in the aged care sector to do what needs to be done. Is it a bigger question that we should add, and that, that question should be, can we afford not to throw more money at it because it just becomes an even bigger problem? Absolutely, we can't afford to not address this. And it's about addressing it at a care level and at a funding level. This affects us all. All of us are going to become older one day. All of us are going to be dependent on the aged care sector. It affects everyone. We all have family members touched by it. And people who are in residential aged care as well as in home care deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. They have that right to that and that needs to be improved and it needs to be done now.